Street Joinery and the American Craftsman Podcast are proud to partner with Montana Brand Tools. Montana Brand Tools are manufactured by Rocky Mountain Twist in Montana, USA. With numerous patents dating back to the invention of the hex shank system by our founders, we strive to produce accessories that add precision, flexibility, and efficiency to your toolkit. In addition to woodworking tools, we produce many high-quality cutting tools that are used by the aerospace, medical, automotive, and industrial markets. Our end product has a fit and finish that is beyond comparison. Montana brand tools are guaranteed for life to be free of defects in material and workmanship because we build these tools with pride and determination. For 10% off your order, visit montanabrandtools.com and use the coupon code American Craftsman. Oh my God, you hear those sounds? Coming out of me. (laughs) (laughs) That's, That's happiness. Welcome back, people. We're locked and loaded. Third one in a row. Yeah. It's a marathon here. It's three weeks time for you. We're gonna keep harping on that. <laughs> it's like been... time travel. I know. Um, yeah, welcome. Episode three of season two of the American Craftsman Podcast. Yeah. The the title I got this one is uh, period furniture, materials, techniques, finishes, and applications. Getting down into the nitty and gritty. Yeah, yeah. So I guess we'll just jump right into it. Yeah. We got nothing else. You know, there's no beer of the week anymore. People no. are probably wondering, what happened to the beer of the week? Well, it's only 10 o'clock. <laughs> got, got my Pellegrino. <laughs> Cucumber, <laughs> melon, seltzer. <laughs> we we, we got switched some high, from coffee. Some highfalutin beverages. Yeah. Bowl and basket, baby. Yeah. So so we're going to talk a little bit about the tools and... Um, uh, the types of joinery that... The, Develop and uh, they're used. What else we got in here? Um, construction techniques, mm-hmm. materials, and a, a bit on some finishes and things like that. Mostly, what what was available to these folks back right. then? And um, yeah, I mean, if you're gonna learn about the furniture, you gotta learn about how it was made. What what are the real um, techniques and everything. Yeah, it, it, surprisingly, and not a lot has changed. Right. At least, I mean, let's let me backtrack a little bit. <laughs> All, we have a thousand, not even a thousand square foot shop, nine hundred square feet, something like that. Eight sixty four. It's two guys. We got basic tools. We have machinery. Mm-hmm. Um, but the from reading through this when I was uh, putting it together. A lot of what we do is still done the same way. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, there's, of course, bigger shops like over at Tom's. He's got a lot more mechanization. Mm-hmm. He CNC cuts the sides of his cabinets, the big edge banding machines, well, spray he finishing. It. Yeah, somebody does it for him. Yeah. Um, purchases, doors, and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, obviously, you know, those techniques are are different, but for us, um, it's it's shockingly similar. Yeah. Um, I got a l- just a little preface here. It, uh, ever since we we started to build structures and objects out of multiple pieces of wood, we've had to innovate and find ways to join these pieces of wood. Mm-hmm. Some of those things, uh, you know, they go back as far as like the Egyptians and things like that. Um, and we'll talk more about it. And uh, skilled carpenters were always needed to do this stuff. It's right. all done by hand still at this point in time. Um, and uh, not necessarily with the aid of nails, glues, even, uh, you know, high glue's been around forever. But right. um, and, and we've talked about this uh, just, you know, ourselves. With more machinery, with more, um, you know, outside uh, aid, the, the skill level necessarily decreases. Yeah. Um, even as so- something as simple as, let's say, an edge banding machine where you just take a piece of flat, you know, sheet stock and run it through the machine. The machine does all the work. Mm-hmm. And 
you could still, you know, take a piece of plywood and apply a piece of solid edge banding, whether it's a, you know, like the a mill or mm-hmm. three quarters of an inch. That's still taking some handwork yeah. and some skill, and the machine kind of just takes that out of your hands. Yep. Um, and so the industrial age is something we're going to pass through as we, uh, you know, go through our periods of, of furniture design mm-hmm. and that's going to influence and affect the technique. Things. Yeah, of course. So, um, what did, what did the cabinet makers, joiners, uh, turns, what they do back then? Um, they didn't, as they get into the colonies, they don't have the same strict guild structure I've found. Mm-hmm. So things are a little bit more loosey goosey. You know, people can, uh, <laughs> it's kind of like today when we found, what did we found we needed, uh, we, that we were indeed home improvement contractors because yeah. we like screwed Install things to cabinets. somebody's home. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we had to get the, a license, right? And, uh, or, I, yeah, I don't know if they class. It's just like a number, like get a right. number. So not much qualification because to get your our home improvement number was it? It was just writing a check and filling out a form, right? Um, so there's probably a bit of that going on in the colonies too. You know, yeah, everybody's uh, hanging a shingle. You don't know what you're going to get mm-hmm. uh, unless you you come from one of those long-standing traditional shops. Um, and, uh, there were a couple of classifications of guys and mostly the joiners, as opposed to what were becoming cabinet makers, they worked on architectural things right. like sashes, mm-hmm. doors, moldings, um, and, and therefore, and therefore, and that was a terrible segue. <laughs> what do they call that? A uh, and non sequitur? Not, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the tools they had to use. Um, and as tools became better, work necessarily became better too. You know, there's that relationship. But I thought they say tools don't make the man. They don't. But, I mean, if you have sharp yeah. edges, you can cut finer. No, they do. <laughs> that's, I think that's a, a misnomer. Okay. I always used to tell my wife you can't paint without brushes. Yeah, I mean, no, the tools do play a part in making the man. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's mostly in the detail and, mm-hmm. and that's the, the finer elements as, as those things improve. Yeah. And unless you brought tools or imported them from England, mm-hmm. uh, tools were handmade still. Oh yeah. And, and so like if I needed a chisel, where was I going to get a chisel? Yeah. Uh, you know, importing was going to be more expensive. Go down to the, uh, woodcraft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got you got to go to the blacksmith, you know, and uh-huh. he you'll of course be able to make the handle for it, but um everybody's relying on one another. Right. So if you didn't have a skilled blacksmith in town, somebody that could create sharp blades for you, um you know, you were out of luck. Uh I came across uh We've heard the name Duncan Fife. Everybody's sort of heard of him. He's kind of a, a, a famous name, and he's a little bit later on. He, I think, he was wasn't even born until like the late 1700s, and he was uh, like one of the early uh, people who were renowned for their craftsmanship. And mm-hmm. he didn't design anything innovative, but he took designs and really. Uh, hone them to a fine point. And um, yeah, I came across his name when I was looking up like tool kits, toolboxes, right. and his tool chest was famous because of its intricacy. Mm-hmm. Um, he had 350 tools. It's in a museum now. Wow. Everything's compartmentalized, all inlay and everything on the interior, not just on the exterior. Yeah. Um, and that was the way a craftsperson said, I know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And it's like when you show up with like a, a orange Home Depot bucket with some Ryobi <laughs> crammed into it. <laughs> We've seen that. <laughs> it's 
So that was really your form of advertisement. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, how I, I put, how is that different from today? Um, and I'll chime in here initially because what's what I thought of immediately was that back then your advertising was this fully tangible thing. Mm-hmm. You saw it in person, you touched it, you, right. you could experience this craftsmanship firsthand. Nowadays, uh, I'll, I'll use Instagram as the opposite example. It's all smoke and mirrors. Well, not all, but it can be all right. smoke and mirrors. Yeah, it leaves that um, uncertainty there because, you know, what looks good between here and here is different yeah. than it's, here to here. Yeah, it's all, it can all be an illusion mm-hmm. on, on Instagram and everybody's an expert and everybody's um, great. Mm-hmm. Uh, back then, if you weren't skilled, it, it was pretty clear. Yeah, and, you know, it goes back to what we talked about in the previous episodes. Like, if I was buying something from you back then, well, my sister had something from you, yeah. my brother, my father. You were the guy in the town who made all the stuff. Um, you know, there may have been a few people, but everybody knew who you were. They knew you personally. They had seen the things that you make um, firsthand. Yeah, your reputation really preceded you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there was no avoiding it because... You know, we're talking small, small communities, very right. small communities. So, um, I, I, I didn't have a picture of the the toolbox. Mm-hmm. I couldn't find one in that article, but that kind of struck me. You know, it, the the other thing that struck me was how did he move that toolbox around with much difficulty? He he must have had a few apprentices. Yeah. Yeah, that or maybe sort of stayed stationary. Yeah, yeah. Or you could take it apart in some yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to see it. I I can't remember where it is, but I would definitely like to go check it out. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote here, how did he move it around? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That'll require a little additional research. <laughs> so... Let's get into some of the tools and and think about how they're different and similar. Yeah. Um. We 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 mentioned this earlier. The story stick. Mm-hmm. That that's the big measuring device. That's the. I mean, it was nowadays we have the tape measure mm-hmm. and uh, we can't even get into all the various woodpeckers and all that oh, other God, stuff yeah. for drawing lines and and marking sixteenths. Mm-hmm. But back then it was like, okay, it's going to be this big between this mark and this mark. And let me take it back to my shop and I'll build the case that between this mark and this mark. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the numbers are really just arbitrary. Yeah, yeah. So even now, I mean, we could work, the way we work, we could work in the tape with no, in the shop with no tape measure. We could work yeah. with a story stick, but yeah. we just use, you know, numbers as placeholders instead of yeah. these marks. I like to, I mean, I don't use a traditional story stick, but Mm -hmm. like when I'm doing a bunch of doors, I love to cut a piece of scrap wood that's the size of the door I want to make Mm -hmm. um, and then set my tools to cut to that size. Yep. Um, We all know that once you start (laughs) adding numbers, (laughs) subtracting numbers, um, a mistake can happen. Yeah. You You can lose an inch here or there or... See, the stick confuses me. I'm a numbers guy. <laughs> I, I love the story stick. Yeah. Uh, you know, my own version of it. And uh, so, I mean, w- that's somewhat similar. The The thing for, for creating holes, for boring holes, that just blows my mind, you know, thinking about doing that all by hand. They have the gimlet, um, which is like one of those little... It almost looks like a corkscrew kind of handle, and it's like a little tiny thing. It would be, you know, what I imagine they would do it for, like, you know how we pre-drill? Mm-hmm. That's what it looked like. It would create a hole something like that oh, size. Okay. Hmm. And it almost probably looked. Probably for, na- for nails. Yeah, yeah, probably. It almost looked like it had that kind of um, 
helix yeah, yeah. cut in it. Uh, augers, bit mm-hmm. stocks. Uh, man, those guys must have had some forearms. True. The fro. Yeah, did you ever hear of a fro? Yeah, yep. It's like a, like a knife edge on a handle, basically, like a yeah, 90 degrees yeah. to one another. Yeah, for, for splitting wood along the grain. Yeah, you beat it in with a with a usually with another chunk of wood. Yeah. <laughs> and then split split your pieces. Right, right. All kinds of saws that, that folks had. Mm-hmm. They used squares. They had squares. Don't forget the mallet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Was there a mallet challenge? Yeah. That's what I want to know. Doubtful. <laughs> They had, yeah, red <laughs> aluminum squares, <laughs> harbor freight clamps. Yeah, you know, those wooden clamps really looked a lot like. Oh, yeah. I mean, except they had a wood screw wood in screw, there. Yep. That, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, I was watching a, a Thomas Moser video yesterday, and they're using wooden clamps. Yeah, yeah. In a fact, you know, a factory for lack of a better term. Basically, yeah, yeah. Files. Um, you know, they were taking and shaping wood by hand. So mm-hmm. files, rasps, um, the flathead screwdriver. Yeah. <laughs> I was looking at some drawings of like the old screws, you know, how to like tell them apart. Oh uh, yeah. And like the old ones didn't have any kind of taper to them. Mm-hmm. So it, they must've really, imagine driving one of those in by hand. Holy cow. Um, all the stuff to... You know, cut by hand, chisels, shaves, a scorp. Yeah. That's a great word, isn't it? Yeah, I want a scorp. Yeah. Um, Draw knives, Mm -hmm. all that stuff. Adds, axes for, um, you know, taking those trees down to planks. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gouge, that would be something that the the turner would be using. Right. On his foot-powered lathe. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> we're all imagining that guy on he has that tv show um he wears a little calf like i uh, like yeah, uh, the wood, roy uh, wood, underhill yeah the wood writer yeah yeah spin his little because <laughs> weirdo <laughs> he's a close talker yeah um hide glue i didn't know the hide glue went all the way back to like egyptian times either mm-hmm. um and I also thought it was a lot easier to work with the, than apparently it is as far as, like, maintaining temperature and all mm-hmm. that other stuff. Yeah, I guess they had candles under it back then. Yeah, um, because the open time's not not that long as far as getting that, that prime strength. Yeah, uh, yeah, you got to keep it hot otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the plane, um, I mean, you have... Quite a selection of planes. Eh, yeah. Not quite, but Not really. yeah, for somebody in, in the modern age, you have a good. Yeah, uh, yeah. But that was that was really uh, an important tool for those cabinet makers because you know most of our planes are just you know for cutting you know for shaving mm-hmm. things down. They had the molding planes, yep. match planes for making a joint where two pieces would fit together. Yep. Um. And, you know, if you've ever planed anything by hand, you really got to know what you're looking at with that piece of wood, how to work the grain. You have a book back here with the grain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and working through a series of planes, you know. Mm-hmm. You're not starting out with a—I mean, they had wooden planes back then, but you're not starting out with a number four if you're, you yeah. know, working from a rough piece of wood. Yes. Um, And I found this really interesting— uh, little snippet, and it says a master craftsman expected was expected to build a labor-intensive twelve light window. That's twelve separate pieces of glass and sash. Although he had help from an apprentice in one day. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, here's some other great examples of what they were doing back then. Um, so if you thought making a living nowadays was hard. This is all with the hand tools. Four carved bedposts. Six hours. <laughs> That's crazy. 
Um, Windsor chair legs, 60 in a 12 hour day. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, beaded pine siding. They would make it in 10 foot sections. Mm -hmm. So a hundred feet, 10, 10 foot sections in their 12 hour day. That seems like not that much compared to the other ones. Yeah. Yeah. Shingles, sawn wooden shingles, 350 in a day, mm -hmm. 12 hours. Uh, yeah. Well, I had a long day. Yeah. Here's half a day's work. Six hours. You were expected to make three wooden storage barrels. Half a day. That's a full day. <laughs> we'll carve six chair, uh, three chair legs in six hours. Wow. So I wonder why the, I guess the, those chair legs are much more ornate than uh, the bed posts. Yeah. Because um, you're only carving three in six hours, where mm -hmm. the bed posts you had to make four. That's true. So these guys were rocking and rolling. Mm -hmm. um, even though they didn't have the, the tools and the machinery, they had the nose to the proverbial grindstone. Oh, yeah. Um, the thing that blows me away is the 12 light window and sash. Yeah, because you have to cut all those coping stick joints, you know what I mean? I mean, well, I don't know what kind of... I mean, from scratch. Yeah. From scratch. Uh, and a window, I mean, it's it's a finicky thing. It's got to fit. It's got to operate. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, window and sash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what kind of joinery do these folks have at their disposal? The dovetail? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we... We still use that one. Uh, machine cutting, the dovetail, didn't really start happening until about 1900. So uh, we're, we're kind of, uh, we're, we're halfway between the, the well, we're, we're closer to the machine cut. We use a router and yeah, a template. That, you know. That's a machine. Yeah. <laughs> we're not, we're not, we're not any, uh. But, I mean, we don't have a machine that uh, clamps. We don't clamp our boards into machine, and it just uh, does it for us. Oh, uh, well, yeah. no. Either They didn't have that in the Edwardian times, though, either. You sure? Well, I, I mean, wonder it, what was, they... it was definitely a manual, uh, manual, yeah. uh, manually operated. I wonder what, yeah, I, I, I guess I'll look into that once we get into that period, but I wonder what they had. That'll be interesting mm -hmm. as... Uh, they had routers. Oh, they did? Yeah. Yeah, if wow. you break apart a drawer from that time period, like the Victorian, mm -hmm. it uh, they look just like the half blind dovetails that you see now. Wow! With the round, you know, the round on the inside. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, the lap joint, the full and the half lap. Oh, we'll probably could bring up that. Uh, did we talk about the the glue uh, video on our podcast? Was that just something we did in between our podcasts? That's old news now. Yeah, because if you listen to this podcast, you've seen that video. <laughs> it's been going around like wildfire for the last month. Uh, see, I, I'm not aware of all that stuff. I live in a little bit of a cave. <laughs> you got your dowel joint mm -hmm. and uh, the mortise and tenon. Again, one of the oldest forms of joinery used for thousands of years. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. What else can I say about it? Uh I guess because it's been used in everything from bridges to houses, mm -hmm. ships. Um, so, obviously, it's going to work for furniture. A lot of variations of it. Um, and they did have some crude nails back then. Pegs, wedges uh, could have been forced into the tenons, things mm -hmm. like that. A lot of times, that's how they, they kept those joints tight. Um Drawer construction. Till the mid 17th century, drawer sides were normally nailed into rebates or, or rabbits cut in the ends of the drawer fronts. Not uh, unlike uh, the factory shops nowadays. Yeah. Uh, all that's missing is the number zero biscuit. That's, yeah, if you're lucky. <laughs> all, all that prevented such a drawer front from being torn from the drawer when the handles were pulled were. Two to six wrought iron nails. Yeah, those hold pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Dovetails come in about mid-1600s, which is really the time period we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So they replaced the lap 
nail joint around 1660, and uh, they're a big hit. Um, and everybody's hand cutting them, mm-hmm. uh, obviously. Um, if you've ever uh, seen a, a dovetailed box, drawer box, or box of any kind, you could see how the mechanical fit works perfectly for a drawer. You know, right. you just you can't pull it apart in that direction. Yeah, like you don't if you put the the tails on the front piece, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, right, it just takes a little inspection to realize what the side is and what the the right. front and the back is. Um, and it's a self squaring joint too, mm-hmm. uh, if it's done well. Right. So it's it's perfect for a drawer box. I mean, oh, yeah. it's the perfect joint. Yeah. All right. So, excuse me for taking a little drink. Early on, through dovetails were most common, mm-hmm. and that's kind of where we're at because we use an applied drawer front most yep. of the time. And that's what they were doing. Uh, only they were putting like a thin veneer hmm. over the, instead of like a full on drawer face. Yep. And then what would happen is it was the the ends of the dovetails would start telegraphing through the veneer, hmm. if, you know, with the expansion and contraction. Right. And they thought, well, we got to come up with a better way. That's when they went to the half blind. And uh, they called it the lap dovetail. I, I never heard that uh, name used for it. But it's basically, you know, a combination of the lap joint and the dovetail. Yeah, I wonder why, you know, there's been this move. I mean, every drawer box you see is a half blind mm-hmm. dovetail. I want to know why that changed. Or, or why now do we use that when... Everyone uses an, an applied, applied front. Drawer, right. Yeah, every it, every drawer drawer gets a door, you know, gets a drawer face. Right. That's the thing we should express here, that the drawer face was the front of the drawer box. Right, yeah, which that that's when you see, you know, fine furniture with a half blind and you open the drawer, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like you, you could see a drawer face, you open it, and it's a walnut drawer face, drawer, the front of the drawer is walnut and the sides are maple and it's right. a half blind because the right. front of the drawer is acting as a drawer face. But, you know, any kitchen you go into, it's going to have half blind drawers with a applied face, an additional face. Um, yeah. I don't know why. Why are we hanging on to the half blind? Yeah. Is it just easier to... I think because the machines cut it easier, or No. Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, oh, they're just leaving a little bit of material. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. That that's a good question. Because you save like a quarter inch, you you save a half inch of material overall, because the <laughs> sides are a half inch shorter than they would be if they were through. Yeah. Um, so as they come, as they are working with this uh, half blind dovetail, oh. <laughs> you funny, funny bone. bone. They initially the the tails and the pins are are the same length, and they start you know they're kind of experimenting with what's going to be the strongest, what's gonna what's gonna work out best, uh, and they came up with you know what we have now where there's sort of like that just that thin little little piece at the at the front, mm-hmm. and they still put through dovetails at the back because they were faster to make. Because oh, again, yeah. everybody's making these by hand. Right. Um, this w- this was interesting. The drawer bottoms. Originally, all the drawers, the bot. Now these are solid drawer bottoms, of course. Back then. Yep. They had the grain running in the the opposite direction. I'll call it. Um, front to back. Parallel to the front and back. Parallel to the sides. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, that was a initially how they started running. Yeah, why? That doesn't make any sense. Well, be, um, let's. Well, I'll read it here. Let's see if I can uh, make heads or tails of it. Despite the opportunity for greater expansion and contraction and its ability to distort the drawer box, many drawer bottoms were oriented front to back until the mid-1600s. The drawer fit was left intentionally loose. 
So it allowed for this movement. It didn't cause any problems. Uh, and I know it's, I have no idea why, because orienting the, the boards, you know, side to side reduces the drawer sticking because it reduces the chance of, you know, expansion and contraction binding the drawer. And it was something that allowed wood, uh, tighter fit for finer furniture. Um, no, that's backwards though. No. No, if it, it you're increasing the movement if it's going parallel to the sides because then it's going to bow out the sides when it expands. Yeah, that's the way they did it at first. That's what I, yeah, that's what I'm saying. And then so they moved to you know the way we do it now, front to back. So the expansion and contraction goes front to back. Right. Yeah. And that allowed for a better fitting drawer. This is side to side. Or into the bottom side Reduce to side. Reduce sticking. That's, you know, you got to have my copy. You got to talk to my copy editor. <laughs> well, I was reading it. I'm like, this does not make sense. <laughs> um, and also, it, like, because of the size of a typical drawer box, it's wider than it is deep. Right. You know, so it reduces the amount of expansion and contraction that way, too. Um, I I should have done a little digger deeping. Digger deeping. Deeper <laughs> digging. You can you tell we're in a third episode? Oh my god, we've got five more to go. Yeah. Um, but I don't know why they oriented the boards um parallel to the front and back. Yeah. No, parallel to the parallel sides. Parallel to the sides yeah. initially. Yeah, uh, that doesn't make any sense. Because they knew enough about the wood movement. Right. So why would they do that? I have no idea. Um, my question here is how's modern material and machinery changed the drawer? Well, you don't have to worry about expansion and contraction with the bottom anymore because most people are using plywood. Yeah, that's a biggie. Um, you could do a thinner bottom also because plywood is stronger. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people are using quarter inch, yeah, eighth, that... eighth inch bottoms Cardboard. with a little piece of wood on the, on the bottom with the eighth yeah. inch. Um, yeah, materials, especially, I mean, we know a lot of drawer boxes even are made out of plywood. Yeah. Um, without any joinery, mm -hmm. um, you know, just mechanical fasteners. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a big move to the plywood drawer box, which I don't know. Not for me. No, I don't like it either. Um, and yeah, oh well. I mean, I've seen um, older, like in kitchen rentals where we're doing, you know, replacement of stuff and uh, an old plywood or it was kind of chipboardy back then with veneer on. They really don't look. They don't uh, age well. No, not at all. All right, how are we doing on time? Do I got to pick up the pace? No, I think you're good. All right, all right, we're gonna we're gonna get into the um, the table more in uh, the next episode. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of just touch on um, the table construction and how it was basically a, a top fixed to some supports. Mm -hmm. Um. Do you talk anything at all about the gate leg or the uh, tilt top? The, the how that starts to come into into vogue? No, no, I, no. So, um, in the 1600s, there's a couple of uh, evolutions of the of the table, mm -hmm. um, and it has to do with like how it's being used, where people live, and um, it's you know dual or triple purpose nature. So yep. you got the gate leg table. Um, that's where the leg kind of, they have like that extra leg that runs uh, alongside the, the table's legs and it flips out 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. And then, and then there's the tilt top where the whole tabletop tilts. You ever see those on those small occasional tables? 
Oh yeah, like you yeah. can put it up against the wall. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, there's I was we were talking about this yesterday, the Pembroke table, which is really um, something that happens a little bit later than early American, mm-hmm. but that's when they start doing like the drop leaves, um, that and the gate leg was partly necessary because the leaves were so heavy. Right. And when once they start learning how to, you know, veneer these tops, mm-hmm. uh, then they could go with just like the little sliders that yeah, come yeah. out for the Pembroke. Um, start talking a little bit about the chair. Uh, did you ever build a chair? I built that one stool, but that was it. Yeah. I never built a chair. I've always heard it's... Like the hardest thing to make. Well, you built you built a liturgical chair. Oh, that's right. I had I did built a couple of chairs for the church. I, I got a short memory. <laughs> Never done a chair in my life. <laughs> well, I actually did three. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I won't count the Adirondacks because they're not like really chairs. But yeah, <laughs> I built a few. Those chairs. are fake chairs. I actually did ten <laughs> chairs, but <laughs> I built two. But chairs. those ten don't count. I, I built two or three chairs for St. Mary's. I built another chair for Saints, Peter and Paul. Oh, God. <laughs> We're still hoping to do something for St. Anthony's. Yes, yes. Um, uh, up until the early 18th century, which is the early 1700s, most English antique furniture was joined or pegged in the construction using mortise and tenon joints held together by wooden, wooden dowels or pegs, occasionally a clout nail, which is mm. like a big headed nail. Like yeah. we might I think they call those rose head nails too. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Um so early wooden pegs, they're irregularly or square shaped, um, with a taper to them, and they acted like a wedge mm-hmm. to tighten the joint. It was as it was hammered in. Um and uh over time the dreaded shrinkage <laughs> Happens. <laughs> happens to Especially the best because of because they didn't have kilns. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, well, we'll get into it there. But, yeah, they didn't have kilns back then, so. Yeah. The wood had had probably not reached uh, equilibrium when they're working with it. That's right. That's right. Um, uh, another big breakthrough, well, it arrives in the 1400s. So, as you uh, alluded to uh, in the last episode, a lot of these things uh, happened before early American oh, furniture. Yeah. Um, but frame and panel construction is a big breakthrough for cabinet makers because um, it allows for the movement that's mm-hmm. occurring. There's no such thing as plywood. We hear everything solid wood. Mm-hmm. The bigger a piece is, the more it's going to move. Um, so frame and panel construction allows for a considerable amount of movement in either direction. Um, and cuts down on uh, deformity and things like that. Allows for more complex designs. So designers are taking these um, uh, construction advancements and implementing them into you know what they can do. It's like us. We we see something. We go, oh that that's cool. Let's yeah. What can we do with that? In contrast to now, that designers have completely abandoned <laughs> the framing panel. Everybody wants slab. Oh yeah, um, and uh, you know elements not suitable for frame and panel construction, such as a tabletop. You know how to do that with buttons and all these other mm-hmm. things. Again, you gotta you gotta account for that wood movement. Materials. It's the one thing there was a huge edge on here in the colonies. Trees everywhere. Yeah. Um, Untouched. Yeah, yeah. Oak, cherry, maple, walnut, alder, ash, elm, poplar, pine, pear, like like all the fruit woods, Mm -hmm. chestnut, fir, beech, hickory, holly, sycamore. And uh, uh, off camera, we were talking about the size of some of these trees. Like I wrote down sycamores were like 10 feet diameter. Mm Mm-hmm. Elms, 11-foot diameter trees. Um, so a lot of trees here that we wouldn't necessarily think of as being suitable, but... Yeah. Um, Sycamore moves a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
and you know the all, everything's all growth so even stuff like pine it's it's still soft but it it's it's not like what we have today yeah no it's not yeah that old growth stuff is, is much. um yeah and so wood is plentiful of course you got to you know cut it down mm-hmm. and and all that stuff uh mahogany starts to become fashionable in in the boston area but really not until uh the 1730s hmm. So uh, this leads me, uh, I finally got a little continuity here. This leads me <laughs> to the next thing, which is drying lumber. Yeah. Um, kiln drying doesn't arrive until the 1800s. Um, I did a little bit of research on that. And so everything is dry stacked. You got to have some some forethought in what you're doing. Right. Um, we never d- really dry stacked anything, did we? Oh no, no! It's not suitable for today. Yeah, it's just not. Uh, it's you know, cutting. I've I've worked a little bit on uh, raw timber. Mm-hmm. You cut down the tree. Um, if it's uh, you know, what depend on the size, you might get up on it and just flatten it with a broad axe. Well, first you got to you know skin it with a draw mm-hmm. knife. <laughs> you flatten it with a broad axe. And then you set it up on, you know. Saw books. Yes. And then eventually on stickers, stack it all up, cover it with a tarp. I don't know. I guess they had canvas tarps back then. Yeah, if you stack it in a pool, you know, the top of the log actually sheds the water mm-hmm. off. So, uh, yeah, you know, back then they're not building something and it's going inside a conditioned home. That's so true. Air drying was fine because you're going to deal with a lot of seasonal movement anyway. You're yeah. going to be dealing with a whatever a 20 percent swing in seasonal humidity levels. Whereas now, I got a humidifier on my furnace. It's the same. <laughs> it's thirty five percent, three sixty five. Yeah, yeah. So now you bring a, a a what we would call wet piece of furniture into the house. It's it's done for. Yeah, it's um it's a really good point to make because we have a conditioned shop. Mm-hmm. Which really every shop should be conditioned. Right. I mean if they're making hardwood furniture as we yeah. do because these are going into conditioned environments. Yeah. And yeah, you can have such a swing from an unconditioned to a conditioned home like the humidity level in in homes is very low. Um where, you know, the swing could be too much for the or even frame and panel where mm-hmm. you could have issues, you know. Oh yeah, when I would do something that had a lot of tight fitting drawers on it, I would always do it really really tight. I mean, that's why I mean, especially when I started working at Tom's, it was everybody was giving me such a hard time because I was fitting everything so tight. Yeah. Uh because I didn't always have a condition shop mm-hmm. and then I'd move into move my piece into somebody's home and it's going to shrink down. Yeah. You got to take the seasons into account too. Cause if yeah. you do it in the winter time in an unconditioned yeah. shop and it's tight, well then in the summertime, you're not gonna be able to open the drawers. Right. So that was something I had to learn as I went along. I was pretty lucky with it. Cause, um, you know, I, I, I guess I'm just going to say I was, I was lucky enough to guesstimate a lot of right. the right amounts, but there were several jobs where I had to go back two and three times to adjust the fit of a bunch of doors and drawers. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I was just, I took it as part of the job because I knew I had, I was going to have to do that anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, So kiln drying arrives in the 1800s and you could imagine the uh, advantages, uh, you know, as far as speed and all this other stuff that, Mm -hmm. um, you know, the cabinet maker, and he could, of course, control the amount of moisture in the wood. Uh, it became a lot more predictable for them. Yeah, and there's, like, you know, a certain amount of, like, setting lignin in the wood when it gets heated up like that that does make the wood more stable. Mm-hmm. Even even if you could air dry the wood to the same level as kiln dried, which you really can't, it's going to be more stable when it's kiln dried because yeah. it's almost like it's cooked. Yes. Yeah, it is. It is, yeah. Um 
And well, we got the finishes. What finishes were available? Everything's applied by hand yep. at this point in time. Um, a lot, everything's coming from nature for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I had to look up turpentine to like get a little bit of a history on. Yeah. I, I didn't know that it came from a pine tree. Mm-hmm. Um, so the the stuff we're using today, especially the stuff we use, it, it comes from this. It, yep. We're standing on those shoulders. Um, so the, especially back then, these, for the most part, were hundreds of years in the making, these finishes. Um you know, lacquer and shellac were made from, you know, natural uh, things, you know, bu- <laughs> bugs and yeah. um, the things were colored with uh, uh, earth pigments. Um, one thing I, I, I noted on, on the finishes section here, like if you were uh, cutting a back for something or if the interior... The saw marks were left on for oh, the most yeah. part. Yep. People were not going through and smoothing everything off. No, no. And, um, and even the, the finished surfaces, you know, was hand planed. Everything was smooth, but, you know, there might be some irregularities. Yep. Um, everything's applied and done by hand. Uh, there's no uh, 20 inch plane to send your board through. Yeah, I mean it was common on on stuff that was unseen to just have um, scrub plane. Yeah. Marks basically, so you'd have that scalloped sort of effect um, where you just cleaned it with a scrub plane, and you know you never flattened it. Um, just like our shop, the most common finishes were linseed oil and tongue oil. Mm-hmm. They both have uh, long lineages, tongue oil going back to ancient China. Uh, and they use it for waterproofing items. Yeah. Which is kind of, uh, you know, what we've done in, in a limited amount, like with your cutting board, yeah. and, uh, utensils and things like that. But they take a long time to cure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. like straight tongue oil is like a 30-day kind of deal. All right. You got wax, of course, beeswax. It's it's everywhere, you know, and this is this is going to play a part because importing anything was expensive, yep. just like it is today. It's, it's more expensive, so they're going to try and use what's on hand. Um, Man, and, they had bee suits back then. I hope. Yeah. How are they getting this beeswax? <laughs> Some poor bastard's got to get yeah. that stuff. <laughs> That's a job for the apprentice. Yeah, man. Oh man. Hey, son, go go take out that beehive. Yeah. And a lot of elbow grease went into these wax finishes because yeah. they polished them. They mm-hmm. really polished them. Um, and they would use turpentine to thin it a little bit and make it uh, easier, you know, to put on. Yeah, that's, I guess it's like our car, uh, carnauba wax, carnauba, carn, carnauba wax, mm-hmm. you know, has like mineral spirits in it to right. make it easier to to work. Um, they did have shellac, and shellac's been used for a thousand years or more. Uh, it's not it's not waterproof, um, and that you know comes from the lac bug. We all kind of know that. And at this point in time, it's not really commonly used because it just costs too much to mm-hmm. import. Um, and uh, you know we haven't gotten to the 1800s. Where uh, like the French polish, a building that finish comes in and varnish and all that stuff, um, and for the painted pieces they have milk paint. Yep. Um, and uh, I looked up a recipe. Uh, the, apparently, this dates back to ancient Egypt as well. Wow. Um, so it's a combination of a milk protein, quick lime, and earth pigments. Uh, we could all go out and make our own milk paint. Uh, the recipe I found is calling for one gallon skim milk, hmm. uh, two cups distilled white vinegar at room temperature, three quarter cups of hydrated lime, and three quarter cups of water. Uh, I guess that'll get you white paint, and maybe not even really white. Yeah, milky white, um, because pigments, you know, are are the next thing. Yeah, lime is probably pretty 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 white yeah, too. Yeah, lime. yeah. 
I also found that they used a linseed oil paint, uh, which is basically a, a, a similar thing, except they're substituting uh, the linseed oil. Hmm. Uh, and I, I didn't know anything about this. So linseed oil combined with an array of other materials like iron, copper, berries, fruits, hmm. to create different colors and types of paint. They Lit. thinned it. <laughs> yes, lead. That's white paint for you. <laughs> they thinned it with turpentine or citrus solvent, which is what we're using. Interesting. Yeah, it's, now now it's titanium is in the white paint. Ah, that's why it's like Titian white and all that stuff. And Yeah, if you yeah. ever watch Bob Ross, you know titanium white. Yeah. Wow. So that, there ends my uh, dissertation on uh, materials, <laughs> techniques, finishes, and applications. So, I mean, a lot of it still rings true. Doesn't it? Um, especially when you look at, like, furniture making as as the subject matter. Um Cabinet making has gone off in a lot of different directions. Right. Um, but, I mean, what we do, it's still very close to this. And I think that'll be a common thread throughout the whole thing is that the the techniques and the materials and the finishes, they've changed a little bit, but they haven't changed that much. Right. If, if you're not in a big shop environment that's doing a lot of processing, most of this stuff is going to be very small refinements mm-hmm. of, of uh, these early times yeah i mean when we get into like the you know the early 1900s and later probably not the whatever's after colonial well well no i guess maybe there might be a couple between here and and uh like the victorian which is when i guess the more machine uh stuff starts and then you know you get into the the mid 1900s where mass production starts mm-hmm. to become a thing and different materials start becoming uh part of the design yeah plywoods and your formicas and Plastics, stuff like that yeah, yeah 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 i mean formica was huge in the 50s and, yeah. and 60s and 70s and it's huge now but bakelite it was like a it was like a nice thing then <laughs> right. it was, you know <laughs> yeah, well, whereas now it, was, it has like it wasn't sneered at yeah it's like a cheap you know, if you do that, you're doing it because it's less expensive. Whereas back then, you were doing it because that was a cool design. It was an innovative material. Yeah. Um, they didn't have any innovative materials. They were just no. were just dealing with wood. And veneer was another thing. Like, because today veneer sort of means plywood in it. You know, in that. Yeah, for it, the most part. In our line of work, mm-hmm. we're not dealing with fine furniture and stuff like that for the most part where veneering is still an art form. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how they cut veneer back then. Yeah. That's uh they didn't have uh band saws. Wow. I guess we'll probably start learning a bit about that as I we get into it, the Yeah, they were hand sawing. Yeah. With a big whatever carcass saw. Yeah, my sixteenth inch. I wonder if there was, like, a special kind of plane that might do that. I mean, well, yeah, their veneers had, they were thick. Yeah. You know, they had to be thick because there were no vacuum bags back in the, <laughs> or contact cement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. Well, that was a good one. Yeah, uh, I I could certainly appreciate, um, you know, how hard it was to do those some of those most basic tasks, yeah, um, because we do more than a lot of small shops, mm-hmm. you know, because we get our stuff in kiln dried rough and we joint and plane it and all these other things. Mm-hmm. And, um, but the, the processes were so deep back then, and yeah, um, your knowledge base, there were there was no room for error. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, here, you know, we can really lean on materials like a drawer, a plywood drawer bottom. Just think about how much easier it is just doing that. Yeah, then gluing up a panel. A plywood then... case back. Yeah. Like all the stuff we still use plywood for. Even when we made a big piece of furniture out of cherry, completely out of cherry, still had a plywood back. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they probably had frame and panel backs or they had... Mm-hmm. 
ship lap backs, tongue and groove, you know, think of all the extra work. Yeah. It's yeah. like building a whole another piece of furniture. Exactly. Exactly. And uh uh I wonder what the I wonder what the salary of a cabinet maker was, you know, compared to other vocations. Yeah, I don't know. Like I wonder if it was like a well paid position. I don't know. I think the playing field was a little more equal back then too. Yeah, like know, people just kinda got just, paid like a, a doctor got paid the same as a cabinet maker. Yeah, probably. Yeah. That that's curious. I wonder where we can find that information. So uh I guess we're gonna wrap it up. Yeah. If anybody's got any questions? You know, that might be something that we get into where we're uh, answering questions uh, that are kind of like a few weeks or a month old. By the time we get to the next thing, you know, we can go back over yeah. stuff in review. Um, and we'll do our best to, uh, if it's something we don't know, research it and, and get the answer. Yeah, well, yeah. We'll have to see. That's going to be, I don't know if we can squeeze in another. <laughs> Another episode. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're, we're, we're running a tight yeah, ship we're, here. Uh, we're halfway through the day. We're only three in. Uh-oh. Uh, so it's time to go. Yeah, well, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed. And we'll see you next week. Yeah, ciao.